Today I'd like to look a little bit at the weirdness that can occur when we're looking at a sequence of functions and, well, the function that this sequence of functions converges to. And we're going to do this via a couple of examples. And as we look at this, these examples, we'll uncover the need for two different types of convergence of functions. Okay, so let's consider the function or the sequence of functions f sub n, where f sub n of x is x to the n minus x to the 2n. And we're going to consider this on the interval from 0 to 1. Okay, well, let's maybe start by noticing the following. So let's observe that f sub n of 0 is the same thing as f sub n of 1, which is equal to 0. And uh, this is going to be true for all numbers n. I think that's pretty clear because 0 minus 0 is 0 and 1 minus 0 is also 0. And then let's also note that if we have some x value between 0 and 1, then you've got this inequality of powers of x. We have x is bigger than x squared, is bigger than x cubed, is bigger than x to the fourth, so on and so forth. And in fact, and this is a fact that we'd probably use on this channel all the time and not really worry about it, if you take the limit as k goes to infinity of x to the k, you would get 0. And that's if x is between 0 and 1, that is. Okay, so observe that we can put all of this together to see that for all x on the interval from 0 to 1 inclusive, we have the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of x equals, well, it's going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n minus x to the 2n, which is, of course, equal to 0 because both of those terms approach 0. Okay, but then let's maybe also note the following. And maybe to motivate what we're going to explore now, let's look at an animation of, well, these sequence of functions being graphed one after another. And this is an animation from n equals 0 to 100. And what you'll observe here is that it seems like the maximum of this function stays the same, the maximum value. But the place where that maximum value occurs is changing. So let's maybe explore exactly what's going on there. So let's find, well, the maximum value and where it occurs for all of these f sub n functions. And we know that we can do that because we have a continuous function on a bounded domain. And by the extreme value theorem, well, we know that there is a maximum. Okay, so anyway, let's get at it. So we can take the derivative here. So that's clearly going to be equal to n times x to the n minus 1 minus 2 times n times x to the 2n minus 1. We need to set that equal to 0 to find the critical points. Let's factor some stuff out. Let's observe that we can factor an n and an x to the n minus 1 out of the whole thing. And that's going to leave us with 1 minus 2 times x to the n. And we want that to be equal to 0. And, well, we're looking for critical points, which are generally thought of as slightly different than the end points here. So the end points here are 0 and 1. So if we're looking for critical points, we're looking on the interior. So that would be not when x is equal to 0. So that means this bit in the parentheses would have to be equal to 0 to achieve a 0 derivative. So in other words, what we need is x to the n times 2 equal to 1. Again, like I just said, that's by setting this equation equal to 0. But now let's observe that that's going to give us n equal to, or sorry, x equal to 1 over the nth root of 2. Okay, 
And so now let's introduce a little notation. Let's maybe set x sub n equal to one over the nth root of two, and maybe observe that f sub n has a maximum at x sub n. You might say, well, how do we know that it's not a minimum or just some other you know, critical point that doesn't give us an extreme value? Well, notice that we get a value of zero here. And well, we'll check that we get a non-zero value here, but then since we're on a closed domain, you just pick the biggest one out of the critical points and endpoints, and you will get your maximum. So let's find the maximum value. So like I said, we just determined where it occurs, this x sub n value, and now we wanna find its value. So we have f sub n of x sub n, well, that's gonna be equal to, well, it's gonna be one over the nth root of two raised to the n minus one over the nth root of two raised to the two n. But look, the nth root cancels with the nth power, really in both of those cases, we're left over with a square in the second term. So that leaves us with one half minus one quarter, which is one quarter. So it, Fn has a maximum of, well, this one quarter at x sub n. Okay, nice. But that actually seems to contradict what we saw up here. But I'll really point out why it doesn't contradict that after writing this down. So here's the weirdness that's occurring, which is gonna be in that magenta box. Let's observe that if we take the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n evaluated at x sub n, we get one quarter, which is not equal to zero. So, well, how does that differ from what's going above? Well, notice that this thing that's happening above, this is a fixed value of n between zero and one. Whereas this x sub n is different for each value or for each function that we're at. Okay, well, it seems like there should be a class of functions where perhaps these limits line up, and, it, and there are. And that is functions that don't just converge, well, I'll say point-wise, converge for every x, but maybe converge uniformly. So the function itself is converging to another function instead of the values of the function conserving, converging to the values of another function. So let's maybe get those definitions on the board and then we'll explore why this does not converge uniformly. Let's look at a couple of definitions that are gonna really clear up the intricacies of what's going on here. So we say that fn converges to f, where those are functions pointwise on a set A, which is a subset of real numbers, if for all x in A, the limit as n goes to infinity of f sub n of x equals f of x. Now it's really important here to notice that x is fixed before the limit is applied. That makes this limit right here really just a limit of numbers. Sure, those numbers are values of some certain functions, but it's really a limit of numbers, like I just said. Now, we could write the epsilon n definition as follows. It says, for all x in A and epsilon bigger than zero, there is a natural number n, where if n is bigger than or equal to that capital N, we have this difference of f of x and f sub n of x is less than epsilon. And since this x was brought into existence before this n, that means that this capital N could depend on x or epsilon. Now, let's compare and contrast that with uniform convergence. And that says that a uh, sequence of functions f sub n converges to f uniformly on a set A, a set of real numbers for the purposes of this video, if for all epsilon bigger than zero, there is a natural number n, so that if little n is bigger than n, then we've got this difference of f of x and f sub n of x, uh, 
less than epsilon for all x in A. So this is a true limit of functions. So really one function can be thought of as converging to another function. And that's because this n, well, that's being brought into existence before we talk about what value of the function that we're looking at. So it only depends on epsilon. It will not depend on the point we're at versus what we had up here. Okay, so what we'd like to do is show that our example sequence of functions is, uh, well, pointwise converges. We already really looked at that, but we want to show that it does not uniformly converge. So we want to negate this second definition. So let's recall that when negating, we have for all statements changing to there exist statements and vice versa. So let's see, that's going to say instead of for all epsilon bigger than zero, that's going to say there exists an epsilon bigger than zero. And then instead of a, there is a natural number in, we're going to have for all natural numbers in. But then since we have this inequality right here, we might as just say as well just say for all natural numbers little n, then we have to negate this part right here or uh, maybe like switch the order here just so it's not as confusing. This for all x will turn into a there exist x. So there exists an x in A such that absolute value of fx minus fnx is bigger than or equal to epsilon. Okay, great. So I'd like to point out here that the existence of this x comes after our for all n statement, so this could depend on n. So let's call this x sub n. Great. Now, notice that matches up with the notation that we had before. So with our previous example, let's just write some things out. We had f sub n of x equal to xn minus x2n, and we were on the interval from 0 to 1. So that's our interval a, or our set a, I should say. And then we had our function f of x equal to 0. But now we can show that this setup right here satisfies the negated definition of uniform convergence. In other words, the definition of does not uniformly converge with the following choices. So let's take epsilon equal to one quarter, and then we'll take x sub n equal to one over the nth root of two. And then let's observe that if we look at f of x sub n minus f sub n of x n, we get that's equal to one quarter, which is bigger than or equal to our epsilon. It's in fact equal to our epsilon. So, well, what that shows us is that f sub n approaches our function zero pointwise. Well, we already know that, but not uniformly. Okay, great. Okay, so this is like a really important type of counterexample to have in your mind at all times is when something satisfies a certain definition but not a stronger version of that definition. In this case, pointwise convergence but not uniform convergence. And it's always important to know these types of counterexamples because it reminds you why there are two definitions and not just one definition. Now, before we leave, I'd like to look at an example of a function that does converge uniformly. And maybe I'll call this function g sub n. So let's define g sub n of x to be 1 over n times the sine of n squared x. And let's notice that this most definitely converges uniformly, and we can prove it via this definition very quickly. So let's uh, say that we are given epsilon bigger than zero, and then what we'll do is take a natural number n bigger than one over epsilon. So if epsilon is bigger than zero, then one over epsilon is well, a real number, and then by the Archimedean principle, we can always find a natural number bigger than any real number. That's what we've done here. 
But let's observe that says that one over capital N is less than epsilon just by maybe taking the reciprocal of that inequality. And then let's observe that if N is bigger than or equal to N, then we have the absolute value of G in X minus zero, just to remind us that this is also approaching the zero function. Well, that's gonna be equal to one over little n times the absolute value of sine of n squared x. But sine is always between positive and negative one. So this is less than or equal to one over n. But now that's gonna be less than epsilon by our assumption above. And observe that this is going to work for all values of x. We haven't even brought a special value of x into existence right here. Okay, so good. Well, we've got this example of uniform convergence. Now, you might have a follow-up question, and are there functions associated to this function, maybe naturally associated to this function, that are automatically uniformly convergent as well. And no, there are not, or you know, you don't always get uniform convergence. And what I mean here is if we consider the derivative, so let's look at g sub n prime of x. Well, what we'll get just by the chain rule is n times cos n squared x. Whereas if we take the limiting function that we have up here, or over here, I should say, the derivative of zero is zero, but this g sub n prime does not converge to the zero function. For instance, if we look at the limit as n goes to infinity of g prime of zero, we get infinity, which is not equal to zero. So this doesn't even point-wise converge to zero, let alone uniformly converge to zero. So what did we just notice here? Well, we had an example where g n converged to g uniformly, but then g n prime did not converge to g prime, and I'll just say even point-wise. So I guess the real takeaway here is when you're looking at convergence of functions, uniform, point-wise, whatever, this is a much stickier situation than what's going on with just convergence of numbers. And that's a good place to stop.